can just tell me your full name. Okay, my name is Jersina San Miguel Avalos. My name is Kevin Fernando Granados. Jasmine Pérez. Where are you from? Dominica. My time in Dominica was, was fun, was more productive since I was working, going to college and all that, maybe on my own, yeah. What did you study? Business, administration with economics and accounts. Yeah. And when did you come to London? In July 2017. Yeah. Why did you come? To better my life, of course. Yeah. And my mom gave me the opportunity, so I had to take it. And, um, yes, I think it's everything. Mm. So your other job is very late in the evening that you it's start? It's 7 to 9. Okay. 7 to 9. I'm born in Bolivia. Yeah. 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 So what, what did you study there in Bolivia? Well, I um, finished the high school and then I started studying for secretary mm -hmm. um, and I finished there that and um, tried to enter to the university. So what, what did you qualify in when you was in Bolivia? Well, um, just for um, secretary mm -hmm. and finish and have the all the levels there. Yeah. So what yeah. made you decide that you wanted to come here? It was not like, it was just because I want to um, know, mm -hmm. I want to meet how is London, how is, because um, the, my, my family said, or my mother said to me, you want to go somewhere, it's another country, mm -hmm. and I said, I pick up London because it was, I know you can be different, but here it's like a, to start from new, from everything. So I um, decided to come to London. Yeah. Yeah. You can speak in Spanish. Bueno, para una oportunidad de, de trabajo. Mm -hmm. What did you work as in your country? <coughs> eh, tuve dos eh, tuve dos empleos por eh, por tres largos años dedicado siempre a, a sobre mi carrera eh, dedicado a, a lo que es la, la, la agricultura y, y la ganadería de, de mi país uh -huh. yo soy de Honduras eh, América soy eh, ingeniero agrónomo I expect everything to be easier no just get a job like that. I expect all that to be easy on me. Yeah, especially my qualifications. I expect a better job even, yeah, better pay. I was at Everington downhill because I realized I would have to do everything over again. They were asking me for everything over, which I think it was unfair because I had to repeat my studies. I did three years and that would be unfair. Let's, look at, let's remember the money that I paid into my education, my time spent into my education and that is like to me I just find it like my age would be past that and I'm getting older. Of course I want to go into something else, something higher. It was, it was just wasn't making sense. And to me it's like I spent so much effort into putting what I thought would be better for me. And now when I come here to repeat. What would your advice be to someone who is thinking about coming to England? Well, first, if they have the chance to learn English in their countries, can do it. My advice would be think twice. Know where you come from, know where you want to go. I think you should seek information for yourself. Think what's best for you and what situation you will be putting yourself into. She was a very strong, very independent person, very loving person, and she kept the family together. And uh, when there was anything on in the car that needed dairy things, mm -hmm. well, my mum supplied them. Yeah.
when we were out at the farm uh, and destitute really mm. she went to church for help and they said no despite the fact that the church was supposed to, supposed to and my mother never went back to that church Uh, she had a hard life. How she uh, kept the family, she kept the family together. I went into secondary school in 1943. Yeah, you see that? You see that? That's Rose. Mm -hmm. This one? Yes. Yeah. Do you know what that is? What's underneath? <laughs> a very faded dad and uncle in the Yes. <laughs> so what do you think the rose is? Mm. That's Fiona's rose. Is it? Yes. Picked on her birthday, the 11th of December. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, my lover's like a red, red rose. It's um, uh, Burns Poem. Yeah. I don't know whether you know it. Definitely rings a But, uh, and I will love thee still, my dear. Aye, she loved her garden and she loved just sitting out, sitting, looking out uh, from the kitchen. And it's just so bonny. Mm. That was what she would say. <laughs> that your heart grew big enough <laughs> to accommodate more than one love. Mm. And that is, you know, you know full well that Fiona's never gone as far as I'm concerned but she did leave me a, a wee thing to be found I can't quite lay my hands on it uh, a wee, it was in, in her purse mm -hmm. which I would obviously find yeah. and it more or less said don't grieve for me when I'm gone mm -hmm. but keep a place in your heart Mm. And that's it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big place in the heart, but the heart has grown, yeah. and it does when you've got a family. I, I should have thought about that, but I yeah. didn't. And it was only when my heart expanded enough to accommodate mm -hmm. my love of Bunty, yeah. along with the love of my family and yeah. and Fiona. But uh, yeah, so that that. That's that, but hello, who's that? Mila. You hear yourself? Yeah. How cool is that? Let's pass it back. What job would you like when you're older? Um, mama. A mummy. And would you like to be like I am? Yeah. Or even better? Better. And how would you be even better? What's that? Steps with a K. Oh, you tell us. Oh, so you do cooking? Yeah. Baking? Yeah. Oh, Mummy, not very good at baking. Yeah. No. Uh, who baked... Have you broke that? Who baked your birthday cake? You! And where's Mummy been going to a lot? Cancer Club. Is she got the lemon? Is she got the lemon? When she met your dad, um... She was so happy, you know, she obviously had found the right man. 
you know, when you were born and Rowan was born, and uh, when she was huge, <laughs> but respecting you. <laughs> yeah, she was so happy. Your mum loved Christmas, so is Christmas hard? Yes, of course it is. Up until this year, I've massively struggled putting Christmas decorations out, which I want to do because your mum made them. But even last year, I was crying the whole way doing it. We went shopping in Oakhampton, but your mum said her head it was so bad that she just wanted to sit in the car, so she sat in the car. And then we came back, and on the Saturday, she said, like, it's just getting unbearable. So we took mum to hospital. They scanned her head, and they found a tumour. <laughs> right in the middle of her brain. And it was the size of a golf ball, which was a real shock. I didn't think, and I don't think any of you either realised how soon it would happen. And I think that's maybe why your dad didn't and, and mum didn't prepare you perhaps quite enough for what was going to happen. We then hit the, the last three weeks. She spent the whole time in bed. She got up and had a shower and then went back to bed again. I can remember granddad saying to me, you know, Jackie won't come out because that's what I've got inside board, and I just broke down. <laughs> On the day she died, which was June the 4th, 2010, um, your dad, you, Rowan, myself, we were all in the room. I knew what was going to happen in a few minutes, and I didn't want to intrude on you three. So I picked up the chair and I said to your dad, I'm taking this chair out of the way. Something happened. I think your mum was struggling to breathe. So I pushed the button and the staff came in. But because so many staff came in, I mean, then he said, oh, I'll get out of the way, I'll get out of the way. After a while, Rowan came out and he said, she's gone. And how, how did you feel then? I can feel now. <laughs> now is that? Well, I'm sort of reliving it. We could have a mutual crying. <laughs> I guess I keep reliving that, that, that time and reliving it, living it. And I can keep hearing her last breath. You dealt with it in your own way, you shut yourself away. As your parent, you want to put a sticky plaster on it, make it all better, but you can't. Yeah, the single hardest thing is carrying on day to day. Being the one who's left when you're used to being a couple is hard because there'd be things that you do that, that you need to do that the other one used to do. So your mum always used to cook roast dinner. And I can remember the times I was in tears in the kitchen because couldn't cook bloody roast dinner. You don't know what it's like to lose a child. A lot of people don't know what it's like to lose a mother or father when you're a child. I think there's a sort of built-in thing inside you that just helps you keep going. You've got to do the ordinary routine things. I feel desperately sorry for my lovely son-in-law. He's coped well. As you know, he phones me up every Sunday. I think I struggle most days. I've had numerous bouts of counselling, depression, being taken to A&E to the crisis team. I've had intensive therapy over last Christmas. And I think mentally I'll never be the same again. I think it's just scarred me massively. There are certain bits of music I can't listen to. I used to spray her perfume on the pillow in bed. I kept all her clothes in the wardrobes for ages and didn't change anything. It was almost as if she was there, but not there. But that gave me the comfort. I guess I was trying to keep myself she was going to come back. You know, I can remember walking around the house and, and just thinking, well, everything's still in the place. Nothing's moved, but it should have moved. It should have, it, it should be this, it should be that, and it's not. I guess luckily for me, I had you and Rowan. As time goes on, it's a slow realisation that person's not going to come back. It's just the slow build that you never can see them again and that's it. 
tell you at the time you don't realise, but death is really final. I hate Christmas now. I go abroad to avoid being around my family because of the pain that still remains. When mum was ill, everyone said she'd be okay. She wasn't. Now I can't trust anyone. It's hard to form relationships with people or let anyone in, and I hate that. I remember after mum died, we had to look after ourselves. Dad couldn't do everything for us, so we had to grow up fast. Even now, saying the word mum seems strange. At the time, so much was kept from me to protect me, so I created my own version of events. Now I'm beginning to learn the truth, which is hard, because it's not always what I believe to be true. After mum died, we all went our separate ways, yet have all ended up the same, just trying to hold on to that bit of mum. I don't think it just affects the person who has got it. It affects massively the lives of those around them. And when it takes them away, it will affect those people's lives forever. The most precious thing I've got is actually a text from your mum when she was in hospital that last time. Here we go, messages, inbox. And I would be absolutely devastated if this was wiped off. Shall I read it to you? It says, night, night, that is spelled N-I-T-E. Thanks for sitting with W-I-V, me today and chocks, etc. kiss, kiss. Radio, okay, more to mo, after, n kiss, kiss. I guess over time you, you accept the fact that she's not coming back and you, know, you focus on different things and it's, it's always getting worse. It gets worse and it gets better and it gets worse and it gets better. So at the moment I'm still trying to sort my life out. I'm still find things hard. Certain things I find hard to do, but I'm sort of working on to get better. So my current one is to try and do more in the garden because that's where your mum did stuff. And it's taken me a number of years to do anything like that. And uh, this year's the first time that I've actually planted the veg patch out because in the past I used to grow the veg seeds, but your mum always used to plant them out. And it's just struggle with things like that. And it's things like when rooms need repainting, it's becoming now okay to paint them in a different colour, but they need to be similar. My mummy has cancer. My mummy has cancer. My mummy has cancer. Cancer. What mummy has inside her tummy? Lemon. The lemon. And what's the other name for the lemon? Cancer. So I've always had a very close relationship. There's a very strong bond between them. Um, and and that hasn't changed. But but I think as Mela watches her mum change it's very hard for Mela and it I think it probably frightens her a bit although she, she doesn't realize that the reason that the tumor is called a lemon is because the doctor described it described it it was the size of a lemon and to make it easier for her to kind of understand we've called the tumor the lemon um so we chat about the lemon she knows that male she knows they might not get better so she has actually asked me what, what will happen if she dies, who will look after her. But in some ways it's good because she's brought that up just randomly as we're driving in the car. That She's getting prepared and it's going to be awful for her, but I know she'll be well loved. I think me and her uh, granddad are just battling with just the day-to-day -day of it because really we're supposed to be retired now between us, you know, we're taking Rebecca to all her appointments and we're looking after Mela and so between us we're doing it. There is a hundred percent there's no way I'm going to be cured you know um so it's just a case of wait and see I mean in my head I have that I'm not going to be here by next Christmas. What I want to do and it's my choice that I've decided to do is not chase all those things is enjoy the moments now with Mela and my family and my friends 
And uh, yeah, make sure I smile each day. I'm going to die. I can't change that. There's no point me stressing about it. We've tried all the treatment options. I've had stillborn child, abusive relationship, just get out of the re abusive relationship and then uh, find out I've got the, uh, the old big C, cancer. Um, so, which is pretty bad. And then find out that that cancer is terminal, so there's no hope. And then to top it all off, we find out that, uh, oh, you're also gonna get paralyzed. <laughs> um, it's pretty, pretty shit. It's the worst news you can ever receive, really. I don't think there's much worse than hearing that your child has got cancer. And then on top of that, she's a mum herself, so. Everybody should have the mum, basically, you know. And it's horrible, and if I could change it, I would, but there's nothing that I can do about it, so you have to kind of accept it. How does that cancer make you feel? With the support, that actually she'll end up being one of the success stories. You know, she's not going to be your typical, you know, goes into drink and drugs because she can't, you know, I'd like to hope that She's got a bit more sense than that. If she ends up being a shit when she's older and trying to blame it on the fact that I'm dead and that's the reason why, I'll be pretty pissed off with her. Because yeah, yeah, you can have your moments of upset, but don't use bad behaviour as an excuse. Munchkin. <laughs> you little munchkin. I love you. I love <laughs>
petroleum. A power source like that must be a highly prized state secret. And there's more that keep walking by, and one of them has a weapon. Roger, receive our selection. We're just trying to stop Muslimic. We've got Muslimic rate cams nowadays. Now it's time for America to bind the wounds of division. We have to get together as one united people. It was an image that conjured up memories of America's darkest period of racial segregation and violence. Fear. Rage. And love. Emotions are centered in the lower part of the brain, the thalamus. The thalamus is not consciously controlled. We often become conditioned to react emotionally to words or ideas. I can see where conditioning can be pretty unhealthy. That's true, Jean, but don't forget that conditioning can also be very useful. I'm beginning to see now how important it is to understand your emotions. Thank you. I was not for into the concept of death. I've lost a few people before. But it's kind of weird because it becomes a sort of blur of things. It took a month before he passed. And up until the last time, we didn't really thought he would pass away, but it was definitely on the table. Yeah. Your life goes on still for a bit, actually. And so throughout that month, I was doing a lot, but at the same time, not doing much. So these things sort of like melt into sort of like a weird haze. I used to be a lot more stressed out before, and I feel like when something like that happens, you kind of realise what's actually important. I feel like it really does make you grow up in certain aspects, and it gives you a lot of perspective on things. Obviously, it's the worst thing that's ever happened to me, but it was like, it's been good for me as a person. I mean, I'm much more used to it than I was when it first happened. Like, I didn't really process anything for a couple of years. And there's a lot of things where I kind of was just like, he was here so I could talk to him about it or just show him and stuff, like stuff that I'm doing in my life. I think we're quite a typical British family in that we don't really talk about stuff. <laughs> the classic British kind of um, pretending everything's okay kind of thing. It's like a given for most people that they, um, like your parents are just there. With time you get over things, but like, I kind of disagree because I don't think I want to get over it. 
I think each year, as you change, your relationship with that person that you've lost changes as well. My family is mainly made up of women, so it was really my immediate family, only me and my dad. So I think when he died, I think anyone would have tried to take his role, it would have been strange. If anything, it was the other way around. It was kind of placed on me a little bit. Kind of, you know, in inverted commas, the man of the house. It was something I wanted to deal with on my own. You know, my relationship was, with my dad was a personal one. And I wouldn't expect anyone to really understand it and to, to offer any real assistance. He was definitely the closest person I've ever lost. But every time I think you lose someone that is close to you somehow, it puts back the concept of mortality in your head. You always end up asking yourself these questions like, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? Is it the right thing to do? And I think it comes with that whole thing. Every time you lose someone, it's a bit of a, a good mo it Forcefully becomes a moment where you ask yourself questions about where you are and where you want to go. I was like too socially aware that I needed to keep doing things and not just like get in my own hole. Like, listening to Neil Young in the Dark isn't the best idea. I've had some key conversations with friends right through my 20s at times, you know, every year or two, mm -hmm. where I have reflected and I've had a conversation with them, and that's helped me. It's helped me in my own development. That's helped me kind of understand and perceive the way they've grown up with their family, their, their parents still with them. I want to get on with my life and do stuff. But that doesn't mean I ever want him not to be a part of my life. Like, he still will always exist. I feel like I've always been, like, a bigger picture sort of person. So I've been like, people have it worse. But also, I think that's always why I've probably seen, like, I'm doing well. It's just, like, things could be worse. You touch it when you lose someone close. If, if you've lost someone close to you before, parents or not, it's the same thing all the time. It's just the closer they are. The bigger the space they have in your life, the bigger the void.